doing the information is going to be the slide set is going to be available and there's going to be two movies that you can um, also see online so don't feel like you have to copy everything down this first session is just going to be about uh, starting to understand the outreach process for girls and why it matters and so uh, i think because most of you are here you have an idea that it matters already so um, I just wanted to also give you an overview for the session, what we're going to um, go over. And sadly, it won't be recorded, but <laughs> we'll be able to share it with everyone. And, and maybe in the forum, you guys can also post your ideas about how it went and things you want to share. I'm recording now, Teresa, so we're on. Oh, great. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> so um, great. So a little bit about why we're here. Um, I'm not sure if you know about the SCI activation, the science activation um, cooperative agreements with NASA, but we have one. Uh, it's called Reaching for the Stars, NASA Science for Girl Scouts. And this is a, um, a five-year process where we're creating space science badges from all of the levels of Girl Scouts, from little kindergartners all the way up through seniors in high school. And also, we're trying to connect the Girl Scouts with astronomers, which is all of you. We have some um, subject matter experts that are here. We have some amateur astronomers. We have Girl Scout people. We have people who are both. Um, and we have ASP here um, and Night Sky Network. So I, I really have a good group. Um, and I was very impressed actually reading um, your introductions and your responses to the video. So um, it's really, kind of a, a nice moment to be doing this workshop. Um, NASA understands that it would be great to have more women in STEM and a lot of amateur astronomers feel the same way about having more women in their clubs. Um, so hopefully these badges will have you guys um, having an uptick in astronomy Girl Scouts. Um, so what I mean by that is that um, You'll have more Girl Scouts coming to your events, more Girl Scouts showing up at the telescope, maybe even coming to your meetings. Um, and so that's why it's important to NASA. Um, I was wondering if you have a specific reason why having more girls in astronomy is important to you. Maybe you could just write that in the chat and so we can see how the chat is working for everyone as well. Ah, Jennifer says, because I don't want girls to have regrets. Yes. Oh, someone privately shared, because we have lots of Boy Scouts that come, but not a lot of Girl Scouts. It's important to me because when I was a Girl Scout, it inspired me in so many ways. More girls increase the overall participation. Everyone seeing those, those notes from the chat? Jim says, our goal in Charleston is to provide outreach to everyone. Girls need to know that they are most welcome to join us and participate. Great, thank you. So uh, you guys did great with that. Oh, I wanna be prepared as I can to work with the girls on their badges, yep. Ken, I think you are pretty prepared. <laughs> Ken has actually come to this workshop twice and gotten different people from his club. Um, he's in Northern California, um, nearby ASP, um, and so uh, the Mount Diablo Astronomical Society. Um, Penny says, I wanna see more kids interested in astronomy, not just girls, yep. The opportunity to get exposed to the new discoveries happening in science. There are so many really cool things, uh, so. Great. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts in the chat. And I will ask you from time to time to, how to do, to do that. Um, I just want to mention something about girls and um, astronomy and girls and boys, rather. Um, sometimes you will get people who say, well, girls aren't really that good at science. Um, and so I just wanted to give you a little bit of data so that when those people talk to you, you can be like, hey, 
you know what? There's this test called the PISA, which is um, the Program for International Students Assessment. And so they test 15 year olds in many different countries around the world. And if you look at the abilities for the PISA science scores, you can see that for males and females, they're pretty equal across the board. Um, where things start to get different is who graduates from universities, um, who pursues these opportunities. And so it's not a question of abilities, it's something that happens along that pathway that outcomes that change. So uh, there's a lot of data like this, but I just wanted to share some of it so that you have um, an idea of some things you can share if you need to. Uh, this is uh, um, some of the badges that are coming out soon are the one, the first ones are actually available now. The daisies, brownies, and juniors. We're gonna talk about them a lot. But also there's gonna be ones for the older girls in middle school and high school. So the cadets, the seniors, the ambassadors, they're gonna be coming out this August. And I want you to know that every step, uh, every badge rather has a step where they can connect to the night sky network or go to an astronomy club or visit a planetarium or visit an observatory. So there's lots of times when they can connect with you guys. So um, it's really an exciting opportunity. And if you haven't worked with the Girl Scouts in a while, these are the different um, age groups for the badges that are already out. You can see the girl in the blue vest on the right. She is a really little girl. She is a, a daisy. And they are in kindergarten and first grade. And they are just excited about being with other girls and starting the process and um, just learning about real basic uh, astronomy concepts like the sun and the moon. And uh, the girl in the brown on the left, she is a brownie. And so if you see someone with that brown vest, you'll know that they're a brownie, which is second or third grade. And so they're about seven to nine, 10. And they're learning about the solar system, going a little bit deeper. And then in the middle is a girl in the green vest who's a junior. And juniors are in fourth and fifth grade. A lot of them are getting ready to go to middle school. And they're just starting to have that idea about abstract stuff. So they're going to be uh, more interested in talking about some of the, the really interesting astronomy. And a little bit about the badges. Sometimes people think of uh, Boy Scout badges, um, which has like a list of constellations you have to memorize or um, areas of the sky that you have. Um, Girl Scouts don't have a checklist that um, they have. What they really want is for the girls to have amazing astronomy experiences and sort of wetting their appetite for new science experiences. So um, really think about just having a really appealing, wonderful time, a great astronomy experience with these girls. And so um, here's a little bit of the official Girl Scout information. All of these badges have indoor, outdoor, and online choices so that they can get up and move or work um, and do research. There's always a free low or low cost option they can go to see star parties or field trips on every step and badge. Uh, the younger girls, they just have three steps, but all the older girls have five steps. So they have five steps with three choices, and so they get into a little bit deeper information. Oh, Jennifer says, yes, she's been pitching the badges to people. Great. <laughs> Love to see that. So a lot of the times when we do these workshops, uh, the astronomers really want to know what are the badges about? So um, this is the DAISY badge. And it's, um, like I said, they're really young, kindergarten and first grade. So the sun, the moon, just learning about the stars, not any deep constellations, but if you really wanted to show them Orion or the summer triangle, those things that they can understand a little bit better. Um, some great things to do. Um, also, think about pretend play and discovery. They're really um, excited about um, new objects and new uh, and, and imagination. 
point. So a lot of astronomers do that when they're setting up their telescope, they say who spots the first star. Um, if you do that and have the girls all watch, that's a really exciting way to get them into astronomy. And also their bedtimes are pretty early. <laughs> so um, that twilight time can be a good, um, good time for them to look at things. Um, if you have some binoculars, uh, even if they're toy binoculars, they can really um, be a great tool, but you want to make sure that they're light. Um, big heavy binoculars are hard for little girls to hold. Um, and so just, just check that out. And also I want to know um, if you have something that you've been doing with these very young children, uh, you can share that in the chat with us. Um, so that we can take advantage of your expertise. Also, they love observing the sun. If you have a, a solar telescope or wanna do a pinhole projector, that's a really fun task for them. Or the daytime moon, if you do your moon on the stick. Ah, looking at the moon with and without the scope. Yes, Ken said that. Astronomy being story time before it gets dark. <laughs> Jennifer is an amazing storyteller. Um, I was up there in Oregon um, watching that um, story time and it was really effective. Oh, there's an image of the solar activity in the forum since we can't add images here. Thank you so much um, under the Girl Scout experiences. Great. And so we're gonna go um, away from this younger age where they, uh, have just a brief overview of, of astronomy and go to the brownies, second and third graders, right? They can um, start to learn about what's going on in the heavens. They know about the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars. And they also have this step, step five, which is celebrate and share. So they're gonna be looking at you to see what star party things that you do so they can do it with the younger girls. <laughs> so that's a really fun um, th theme that repeats in Girl Scouts. Um, so great things to do, show them the planets in the telescope. If you can see Jupiter or Venus, uh, those are great things to point out. And if you have the daytime moon, that's also a great one. Oh, um, Jay is, just got on and saying, I give out small red flashlights to children who come to the observing sessions. Yes, and Penny said, helping them build a pocket solar system. Yep, even if they've learned their letters, they can follow along. Yes, we do a lot of um, capital V for Venus and a lot of the capital letters that younger girls know. Um, Another thing you can do is show them how your telescope works, where the light comes in and how the eyepieces can change in and out. Um, also show them that there's a mirror um, at the bottom because that can help them learn about um, sort of how telescopes work and it's a common item that they know about. So it, it helps tie science in with their everyday life. Other things people want to share with Brown, oh, Galileo scopes are great for this. Yes, if you have some, they can be amazing tools for girls to look through. Oh, and Stellarium in the auditorium walls. <laughs> Do you have good Stellarium um, constellation images? I just usually use the, the constellations. Um, I don't use the artwork, so I'll have to look at that. Great. Um, so juniors, as I was mentioning, they're in fourth and fifth grade, getting into the solar system and beyond, and learning about scale and distance and some of those big concepts that they haven't heard about before. So um, this is when you're just starting to um, explore the sky a little bit more and learn about how far the stars really are. So a lot, a thing that's great for them is the travel time to the planets where they, you know, oh, how fast would it be to go in a car to Jupiter? Or um, how old would you be on Venus? Or how old would you be on Uranus? Those, those uh, birthday things are really exciting and lets girls do a little bit of math as well. 
Uh, also, this is the very beginning ages when they'll start to understand how to use star wheels and star charts. And there's actually a step where um, they can make star wheels. So you can either make them with them as part of the badge, or you can just show them how to make it work. Because right? it's a, it, it can be challenging if, if you don't use them. And then also the little tiny hidden gems like Orion Nebula or um, Alberio with the two, um, the gold and blue stars or um, your favorite objects that are um, visible in the sky but that you can show them like the Andromeda galaxy. Okay, so. A uh, little bit more about Girl Scouts in general. They have these three processes that, that's really a cornerstone for the Girl Scout experience, which is girl-led learning by doing and cooperative learning. And I just wanna say that that's why the Girl Scout badges have five steps and each step has three choices because the girls get to pick the step that they're most interested in and that keeps their interest going. Um, also, they would love to get their hands on some learning by doing um, activities. Uh, we'll talk about that more a little bit next session. Also, cooperative learning. I just want to mention that if a girl is talking to another girl or um, if she's on her phone, it isn't a sign of disrespect at all. Um, it could be that they're really excited and sharing and learning together. And that's, um, they could be saying, wow, I just looked at Saturn and it's the most amazing thing to see the ring. And they might be taking pictures with their phones um, and really, really excited about that process. So if, um, don't, don't be upset if that's what they're doing. <laughs> They'd like to share and talk together. Also, um, these are the four STEM outcomes that the Girl Scouts want the girls to um, feel after they've completed this badge, that I can, can do science, that I see the value of science in society, I am excited about more science um, and more STEM. So um, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math, just in case I didn't say that earlier. So I just wanna share that with you as we're getting into this process of looking at girls in science. Um, I really also wanna say thank you for coming out tonight. When you come here, you're already showing up for girls and helping them have better science experiences. Um, a lot of times, there's it can seem overwhelming, but everybody has this um, this baggage that we've gotten in our society, where we've learned that science isn't for girls, or uh, that science is for boys, and all of um, those pieces interact together. Um, that's a bias, but it's not who we are. <laughs> We're, um, we all have the opportunity to, to explore this and unpack it. And so that's why I really want to thank you for coming today and either starting that process or continuing that process of uh, making things a little more equal. And now I'm going to do something that's a little unusual for um, a webinar. <laughs> I want you to just take a moment and um, maybe even relax a little in your chair for a second. If you want to, you can close your eyes. Um, don't feel like you have to, um, but I just want to take you back to um, some different times in your life. So I want you to think about one time where you felt excluded. And it might have been way back when you were a kid and you were the last person picked for gym class or even um, more currently at work when you were supposed to go to a meeting and um, and weren't invited uh, or um, when you find out a part your friend had a party and it didn't invite you to just sit with those feelings for a moment and See how it feels. There's sort of a heaviness about it. 
sort of like uh, walking through water. It's not very easy. Some people feel it in their stomachs or their throats or their head. It's not a real pleasant feeling. So let's move on from this reflection. And I want you to think back about a different experience. I want you to think about the time that you first got excited about astronomy. And maybe it was a beautiful dark night and the sky seemed to stretch forever. Or maybe it was finding Jupiter in a telescope and seeing those little dots, moons. Or the first time you saw a Hubble deep field and all of those little dots were galaxies. So many amazing opportunities in astronomy that can just blow your mind. I really feel that excitement and curiosity and wonder in the universe. And that feels very different in our bodies and in our brains. We start uh, lighting up. We start, I can see even in your faces now on the, that it's very, um, it's, it's just a different feeling, right? Um, so we really want to have more of those second experiences. Unfortunately, sometimes girls have to go through that experience, the first type of experiences to get to the second experiences. Um, and anybody who feels excited on science, um, boys and people of color and girls and kids and adults, all of us can have these um, experiences that can make us kind of fearful of science. Um, probably not anybody who's here, but maybe you've done it once or twice in the past. Um, so, oh, Tina um, shares that she wants to be, for girls today, the support that was not available to me. Yes, yeah, that's a big, a big piece for a lot of women, myself as well, yeah. Is there any way for this experience exposure to be carried into the schools? It's great to have this, but how do we translate this into the education system? Um, okay, so uh, I just was noticing those marks in the chat and um, Penny, we will get into that um, about the school system. Uh, a lot of the, the um, badges are about the outside of school time. So it's a good question. And let's revisit that in a, in a little bit. And so um, I want to share some of the experiences girls have in science. Uh, this is just a short clip of a video that's about a minute, and I'm going to cut it off uh, after the girls finish talking. If you think about it, science is like everything. It can really help you uncover like little, small, little secrets. I built a garage door opener and I'm working on my own website. I built a computer and I opened a fridge with a Lego. When I was slower, I used to think technology was great. And then I started thinking that it was more of a boy's thing. They just think that inventing is like for boys because they have Albert Einstein invented, if he was a guy, and Benjamin Franklin also. There used to be a girl in the robotics class, but she quit, and so I'm the only girl left. Oh, you can't like science. You're a girl. You can't like any of these science things. In commercials, I saw a lot more men doing it. They might really love science, but they might be, like, afraid. People might think, oh, don't boys do that? That's a boy thing. Wow, thank you. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna cut it off there um, because it actually is a, a Microsoft commercial <laughs> and I don't wanna endorse them or anything or, or not endorse them. I just wanted to share some other girls' um, voices um, because they're, they're younger and they're at different stages. Um, I know that we watched in the forum that video about boys and girls toys and um, I forget who mentioned that, um, that the peer pressure continues as they get older. Um, I think maybe Glenn mentioned that, I, I don't remember. But um, it, so this is some of the things that happen as they get older. Um, 
and I want to show you um, the, uh, this other quick movie as well. Um, the first one really was about those feelings that we had earlier, but this is kind of a positive movie. And I want to show you a couple of things. Uh, well, I want you to look um, at it quickly. They have a lot of um, text go across the screen quickly. Um, this is from the, um, the National Science Foundation STEM for All video series. And so this is something that you can um, watch and just see, um, what are some um, positive things that you catch that, that give you um, some inspiration or hope? Do you think that programming is fun or not fun? Fun. Why is programming fun? Because it, it's like you're being the boss of things, telling this what to do and then that thing tells that what to do. Careers in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math are rewarding and often well-paying, but there's a problem. As early as elementary school, girls are less likely than boys to play with science and technology related games and toys. But this raises a big question. Are girls less likely to play with these toys because they're less interested? Or are they less interested because they've been given fewer opportunities to play? The thing that I think is a really big take-home message is how early it starts. That if we want to bring more women into the STEM pipeline, we have to start early. Our research study at the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences at the University of Washington tested what happened when we gave six-year-old children the chance to play a robot programming game. Would girls become more interested and confident in programming? If girls and boys get the exact same experience, would they show equal interest in programming? We brought 96 children into our lab. One group of children learned how to program a smartphone using drag and drop programming and made an animal robot move along a series of tiles. Me and this is us. We also had two control groups. One that played a different game. Which one was a cook? The cook was secretly a witch. And one that played no game at all. Then we asked them all how interested they were in programming and robots and how good they were with robots. In our control groups, we found the typical gender gap. Boys were more interested and confident than girls when it came to programming and robots. But for the children who played our robot programming game, there was no difference between girls and boys in their interest and confidence. And the girls who had gotten this experience with robots were more interested and confident compared to the girls who had not. These findings are exciting. Girls' interest and confidence in STEM are not set in stone. They are malleable. STEM experiences are like a charging station. Each opportunity allows students to charge up their skills and motivation in STEM. If girls get more positive experiences with technology, they have more chances to discover a passion. We found that even 20 minutes is enough to plant that seed and have a big impact on the attitudes of girls in our study. We hope that our findings will also have an impact on educational practice by inspiring teachers and families to provide more of these experiences to girls to broaden their participation in technology fields. Our lab is also looking at other ways we can get girls more excited about STEM from preschool through high school, and we hope that our studies will have an impact by advancing research on girls in STEM. STEM starts early. Age six is not too early to start learning how to program and to learn that programming is exciting. What happens when we give girls these experiences? Cool. <laughs> oh my God, that was super cool. So I just want to um, open it up to you guys. Uh, what did you think? What did you notice about those videos? What was an uh, exciting, um, inspiring uh, thing that you learned? Now you can either unmute yourself or put it in the chat. I come from a generation that when we were in um, the early school time frame. Um, girls were not expected to um, do anything beyond going uh, to college uh, to find a husband. Um, there was no push for them to be, have a career and to move forward. It is nice to see that there are the opportunities to challenge the information, but when you're dealing with just one-on-one, -on -one, we still have a lot of teachers who know don't have the comfort and the knowledge to take things into science, even though they have the internet available in the classrooms, 
their particular background is still lacking to get them to be able to be comfortable in so in these things and so the girl scouts gets a very small group of girls excited but we don't have that translating into the education and knowledge in the school system to continue to push that to get graduates who are exposed because we still have a gender bias in the teaching but we also are pushing everybody to go to college not necessarily go into trades which also uses a lot of stem they still have to use a lot of science mathematics um, the technical aspects to do that um, and so they go to the very comfortable um, touchy-feely sciences which are not wrong they're just not stem and so it's I have that issue with seeing the right things pushed all the way through consistently across all because even as parents our children may become exposed to something but if we don't know it to support it if we don't have the skills to support it then that is one leg of the process that falls down it's like reading to your children and they're small and just because being read to they learn to read better mm -hmm. and and carry that skill but if i'm a parent and i don't know how to do science if i'm not exposed to it if that's not where my education is then how do i support that child right it's a really good point penny i i mean um something we're learning is that um some of even the troop leaders are um sort of scared of science and so um we need to address that and the teachers. Um, we do a teacher institute here where we um, do training for teachers um, and uh, it's a process, you know, we, we can't reach everybody right away, but we are, we just, just have to do what we can do. Um, you know, just uh, Alice was mentioning in the chat that sometimes having sessions for adults first helps increase the number of exciting sessions for kids. Yes, and Jennifer says, it takes me at least two visits with the schools before I can hook them to come out into the field for a science learning opportunity. Yes, so um, that's, that's um, a, really, a really important point that we have to address the, not only the girls, but also their parents and their uh, teachers and leaders, right? Um, and uh, a few people were writing about the video, and I see that um, Ken wrote, I love it when the girls have a wow moment. And Jennifer said, I love the joy of the spark, and learning how to play with something is fun. Yeah, that was a big part of the video See, for me, seeing the girls' faces light up. But I also thought um, how it's, they said even 20 minutes was enough to have an effect on these girls. And that could be the time that you were at the telescope or an outreach event for them. Another thing that I thought was really exciting was the recharge aspect that, um, that it, having these science experiences could recharge the excitement that maybe they didn't feel as much initially, but they get like a, a boost um, in their feelings of excitement. And so I really feel excited about us as astronomy educators and Girl Scout folks and, and NASA folks that we are um, at a time when these things will hopefully um, start, start to change. Uh, we do have a long way to go, <laughs> but um, Yes, Vivian wrote, I love that it only took 20 minutes to make a difference. Yeah. So that's an exciting thing for me. So uh, we have this challenge in front of us, how to, how to take advantage of those moments we have with Girl Scouts, which hopefully you'll be having an uptick in with the badges and the, the, their leaders and parents as well when you're there at the outreach event, right? Uh, Stacy says, it's good to have a starting point. I see Penny's point, and I think the influence of girls in the Scouts might cause sort of a domino effect. Yay. <laughs> I would love that. Sally goes to a public night and learns something neat and tells her friends at school who's not in the Scouts. 
that, that would be, I mean, that would be ideal, right? The excitement builds in one girl and she tells it to others and yeah, keeps, keeps going like dominoes, yeah. One of the nice things about the astronomy club here, the, the Huachuca Astronomy, is that we are doing public outreach to the schools. The kids um, from the kindergarten on are coming in and doing astronomy during the day. Um, they're doing earth sciences over in our garden area. And so we are getting the schools as well um, involved and exposed in, in the school age kids. And that's fun. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, yeah, as we go through this and you feel like there's, there's more parts that you want to say, I don't want to, um, curtail that at all. So, um, I, I, if everybody, everybody gets a chance to speak, then we can, um, share that or we can also put stuff in the forum. So thank you all of you for, for sharing what you learned from the video and what you felt about it. Um, we don't have a a whole lot of time left. Um, so there's certain tools that we're going to have to address this challenge. And we're just going to go into this micro messaging and storytelling part tonight. Um, and then the other tools we'll have will go in the next session, which is next Wednesday, same, same time, same channel. <laughs> so um, just let's, let's head into this micro messaging aspect. Um, a lot of people don't know that term. They might know a term called microaggressions, but I don't really like that term just because I don't think most of these things are aggressive. I think they're really unintentional and um, just things that we just need to pay attention to and learn about. Um, and so it's these messages are just small behaviors that affect how we relate to each other. Um, if you look at the woman, the teacher in the red shirt on the left, you can, you don't even see the student, but you know that she's excited about whatever they're saying because she's looking directly at them. She has this listening pose. She's sort of getting down to their level, um, like leaning over the desk. So that shows that she's really excited and interested about what this person is saying. Um, also in the middle, you can see that the woman is shaking the girl's hand. They're having equal um, levels and they're, they're just uh, seeing each other as, a, as interesting to talk to, right? Um, I even am feeling a little bit bad because you guys are all on the bottom. So when I look at you, I have to look down instead of looking up. <laughs> so things like that about our eye contact can really make a big difference, right? Um, on, so those are some positive messages to send. Unfortunately, sometimes the other side of the coin happens where we're sending negative messages. Um, so for example, this um, girl got a, a comment, you're so lucky to be black, it's easy for you to get into college. And um, imagine how that must feel to not be seen as a, someone who's intelligent, or someone who has value on your own. It's just about your, your skin color that got you ahead. Um, and a lot of times women get this as well, like, oh, you were only hired because you were a woman. Um, and um, those are definitely negative messages that um, go out there. Um, and they, um, they play into our biases as well. I, I wanna mention that the, these slides and ideas that I'm gonna be discussing are from Dr. Alicia Santiago, who is um, a scientist and also a, a educator with the Sci Girls show. I don't know if any of you have seen that show, but it's a really um, a, a, a good uh, piece to watch if you are interested in, in learning more about um, girls doing science. Anyway, um, you guys might have heard about this children uh, draw a scientist test. <laughs> Yay for side girls, she said. Um, so this is something we do in um, Project Astro, which was an ASP program where we do draw an astronomer. And it's really interesting to see um, what images come up and how we can challenge those. So this came about, this um, was in the early 80s. And uh, unfortunately, there was less than 1% when it started um 
that were female. Um, uh, they were dr drawn only by a, a few girls. No, none of the boys drew a female scientist. Um, but luckily that's increased over time. So in 2016, when they've been, they've been doing this test quite a bit and they, um, it was up to 34% of women that were drawn as scientists. Um, and coincidentally, uh, from the 60s into 2013, uh, the percentage of women holding science jobs went up, right? So um, it went from 28 to 49% in biology, from eight to 35% in chemistry, and from three to 11 in physics and astronomy. <laughs> so 11% is not the greatest, <laughs> it'd be wonderful if it was 50-50, but we're, we're getting more people, more women in astronomy. So um, I think that that's also being, uh, um, uh, uh, having an effect on what the children are drawing as, as time goes on. And so this micro messaging bit that I wanna talk about is that, um, both of these uh, women of color are scientists who got, have had this repeated to them many times. I would have never guessed that you were a scientist. And the person who's saying it might actually be saying it from a, a thing of like, oh, it's great that more women are getting into science, or it's great that there's more women of color in science. But even though there might have had a positive intention, what um, these women are, are getting over and over again is that, you don't look like people who are here. You don't belong here. You aren't part of science. You're, I wouldn't have thought of you as a part of science. And so uh, it's, um, that's, that can add up after over time, right? So how can we deal with these things? Um, a part of it is telling stories. Um, so these are uh, three women scientists of color, Katherine Johnson, Mary Jackson, Dorothy Vaughn, who were in um, astronomy, math, science. Um, and part of the reason why I wanted you guys to all write about um, female astronomers who were inspiring is because telling those stories are really important. Um, the reason that a lot of folks now know about these women from the 50s and 60s and the early Apollo program days is because of that movie Hidden Figures that came out in 2016. Uh, I don't know if, all, if you saw it, but it's a really good movie. Um, I, I enjoyed it anyway. <laughs> so um, it just told the people, people the story of these women who have contributed so much. And Katherine Johnson now has two NASA buildings named after her. Um, so it's, uh, oh, the name of the movie is Hidden Figures. It came out in 2016. And there's also, um, uh, Jennifer put that the book has great um, footnotes. That's true. It's a, it's a wonderful book as well. So telling these stories was really important for um, women of color to sort of understand their place in NASA and astronomy um, and start to counteract those messages of you don't belong here. Um, I know a lot of us really um, enjoy Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> Alice is clapping, yes. Um, th this actress uh, was on the deck of the Star Trek. She's, her name is Uhuru. The, uh, does anyone know the, um, the actress's name who played her? Um, it's Nichelle Nichols, yes, <laughs> Stacy knows, right? She was a big influence for a lot of women. Um, and after the first season of the original Star Trek. I met her, she's amazing. Oh, she was a great singer, yes. Oh, I'm so glad that you guys um, know about her. Um, other people in the time knew about her as well. As a matter of fact, she was the first season, it was, um, she had decided that she was really wanted to do more singing and dancing and was gonna go back to Broadway and not be on the show anymore. And the creator, Gene Roddenberry said, well, let's just, put a pin in that and think about it for a little while. Um, and then he brought someone who said, I'm your greatest fan. The person who was the greatest fan <laughs> was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And when she, he heard that she was thinking of leaving, she said his face fell 
And he said, no, you have to stay on because you have an equal role. You are showing that you don't have a subservient role. You have, you're equal with everyone on the bridge. So it was a really um, moving to her. And she said, okay, I'm going to stay on. And she did stay on for the remainder of the series. And um, Mae Jamison, who is, um, the person who in the astronaut suit, the first African-American astronaut, said that when she was a girl growing up, she knew she could go into space because she saw Nichelle Nichols on Star Trek and knew that Black women could go into space. And so this role modeling and storytelling is showing people that if you can see it, you can be it. And so uh, it's really a uh, um, amazing um, effect that this woman had in telling and in inspiring Black women and many other women, as you can see um, by our comments and our people clapping and stuff. So, um, so what if you can't role model, right? We have a lot of folks who are who are men on these calls, and I want to say, we need you. <laughs> we all need to work on this together. And so you can share women's stories. And I want to say that sometimes that's a little uncomfortable um, for me as a white person telling the story of a uh, Black women and their um, history. I worry a little bit about getting it wrong um, or not, not doing it, it well enough. But I want to say it's okay to get things wrong. <laughs> we are in the process of trying to to make things a little more equal and and it's okay to say i'm sorry i didn't say that right i'm going to try that again <laughs> or to say oh you know about this story can you tell me more information about it um to to share the stories as you know them and as best you can because we all grow up with those biases and we're all trying to unpack them so I want to encourage you to, to just do it and be, be humble, but, but do it <laughs> even if it's a little uncomfortable because you can really make a, a big impact. So now it's your turn, okay? Um, I asked you guys to share your favorite uh, females, astronomers. Um, and I shared with you the story of Katherine Johnson. Um, what I did was put the person who shared the astronomer and the f some important information about them. So with Katherine Johnson and doing the Apollo program and math and learning about es um, sharing escape velocities and um, calculating trajectories, that's something that we talk about a lot sometimes in outreach events. Um, so you can talk about Katherine Johnson then. Um, I also want to say, um, I love that, um, I think it was Lynn, I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm remembering wrongly, but um, who said, I don't know any female astronomers. Um, and that's part of the problem. And I, I think that's incredibly brave and wonderful that somebody said, this is something that I want to learn more about and it helps it. And, I, and it's showing me something that, that I don't know about. So I really wanted to say thank you, um, Len, if that was you. <laughs> I should have checked um, earlier, but I really want to say that's great that, that we can share that together in our community and, and feel good about learning together. And so um, if any of you want to talk about uh, your astronomer and why they're so, uh, why they're so um, inspirational to you, um, a few of them are people I love, like Henrietta Leavitt um, <laughs> and uh, Nancy Grace Roman, who was a big supporter here at the ASP, and um, Maria Mitchell and Katie Vaughn, and so many of these people, Vera Rubin such an important person. So I'd love for you guys to share your stories. So the next time like you're talking about comets, you can talk about Carolyn Herschel. And just like two or three sentences about why they inspire you if you would like to share your, um, your story. Well, as I said, in, when I wrote about Carolyn Herschel, she had no formal training. 
her family expected her to be the housekeeper because she had a disease that stunted her growth. And even though she was a housekeeper, she became the, also came, she became the assistant to her brother who was involved in astronomy. And, and as a result, had an incredible impact to what we look at in the stars. And I look at myself that I'm an also came. And um, I have a physical limitation to what I can do, but the opportunity to learn, to be exposed to it is not limited by education. It's not limited by financial circumstance. It's not limited by the, um, the person. It's limited by the opportunity. And Carolyn had the opportunity because she had somebody in her family who was also interested in that and and took her along and made her part of it and um my husband is the astronomer and i'm the also came and he took me along and i found that i really enjoyed it and i enjoyed being able to to bridge the gap between the technical person Mm -hmm. and a person who knows nothing and bring them examples of, of what they can relate to as kind of a bridge between the, the two areas. My husband gets very technical being an engineer um, and, and that turns off young children or some adults who just don't have the words and by giving them examples of what they might be exposed to in the real life, I can help bridge that gap to give that information. And that's the part that I liked when I taught a class um, as an adult was the aha moment, like these children that were learning to program. When they went, wow, when they see something through the telescope and, and their eyes light up, when I could see the light bulbs turn on, um, when you expose somebody to an idea, Stacy gets the same thing. Um, when she's doing it, because we both belong to the same astronomy club, club and <laughs> she, she sees that, and she has them coming out and talking to her, um, and she has the ability, because her son is still young, he's learning, but, but she did expose him uh, to the sciences and give him the opportunity. Um, getting kids out to the sciences on a regular basis requires a commitment from the parent. Right. Right. And that's, that's a, a wonderful story about Carolyn Herschel, that she had the opportunity because her family did. And, and it's a wonderful story that you shared about yourself, that, that you came with your husband and realized your own passion about it. That's just a, a wonderful story. And that's something you can share, probably do share all the time at the telescope. Um, and so that in addition to that, she discovered eight comets and wrote two star catalogs. So when those things come up, whether it's like being the person who came along or, um, or the, the, these comets come up, that's a great way to share share a story of a female scientist. Um, Ken said about Vera Rubin, yes, she had her data that was the first evidence for dark matter. Do you want to say anything about that, Ken? Uh, uh, no, I just was uh, um, interested to just recently find that out, maybe, I don't know, six months or so ago. Uh, and again, at, at the time, uh, it wasn't typical that women would come up with these discoveries. So the, the lead astronomer, who was a male, was the one that, that pretty much got credit at the time. Now we're seeing a turnaround, and uh, she is getting more credit uh, for that discovery. Great, thank you. All right, so um, dark matter isn't going to come up that much with these younger badges, <laughs> but the older girls probably will ask about dark matter and black holes and all kinds of um, uh, newer things in science that we're learning. Um, I, I don't know if um, Jessica Henricks is on here, but she she talked about the um, uh, 
the black hole that Katie Bauman saw. Um, and she yeah, said, yeah, our, our um, Girl Scout Astronomy Club, uh, these are, because those are older girls, we discuss, you know, these type of things quite a bit with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we look at the Andromeda galaxy all the time. Yes, we do. So when you're talking about galaxies rotating, you can say, hey, <laughs> you can, um, there, somebody saw how, studied how the galaxies rotated and her name was Vera Rubin. Or you can also mention that until Henrietta Leavitt came along, we didn't know that that was a different galaxy. We thought we were all in one big galaxy and she um, helped us out with the distance ladder. Um, you wanna, Alice, you wanna tell your story about that or how you connected to the telescope? Uh, well, I, it's in the it's in the forum. But what was great is, I mean, she's always been amazing, and she was part of that whole Harvard computer group. Or, um, and but there is a wonderful play, and if you ever get a chance to see it, um, go see Silent Stars because it does have Andy Jump Cannon and Henrietta Leviette and several other of the computers as part of that. But it it is interesting to see kind of the conditions that they were working with and how they struggled. She was, she was deaf and she, you know, she was struggling to balance, you know, family and her work and getting people to accept what she was saying. Anyway, great play to get a chance. But what was fantastic was we did star parties after four of the different plays, the, the two openings and the two closings. And we had, I was trying to find them these great pictures of the, um, the actors in costume at our telescope. So I've got this great picture of Annie Jump Cannon at my telescope, but I can't find it. So I'll find it and post it. Oh, great. Yeah. And um, I also think that, that it's important to, to talk about how um, she studied these variable stars and, and um, th when those things come up, uh, and also that she um, overcame her handicap. It's, it's a, it's a, she has a wonderful story. Um, and someone also put in there about Hedy Lamarr. Oh, Alice, that was you as well, who um, was an actress, but she also invented um, wireless communication. Anyone else want to share the story of um, their, their um, person who was inspiring to them? Sorry. Okay, so I encourage you guys to keep reading the, uh, the forum and keep sharing. Uh, these stories, we're actually going to make um, down the road um, a series for um, amateurs about um, like sort of baseball cards, but instead um, women astronomer cards. So you can collect them and um, have the images and tell the stories and, um, so, and sort of how you can bring it up. Like we all can talk about Galileo um, and science information that way or about um, the moons of Jupiter, you know, and um, telescopes and a, a lot of those are that way. But oh, <laughs> it's, um, oh, oh, uh, um, Sorry, just coming up in the chat as well. Um, th there's, there's stories we can tell at all of the stages and all of the things that we're looking at in the scope. Um, Jennifer said that she picked Maggie Aldrin um, Pocock, um, who's a, a British astronomer. He, she's kind of like the um, Carl Sagan of the UK. Um, and so um, she'll, be, she'll be putting that in the forum, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, Jennifer, uh, by any chance, do you want to mention um, your story um, about being a, a child and having your astronomy um, experiences? Um, because that relates to our um, next week ideas. Um, 
if you can, it's great if you could interview a woman about her science experiences. Um, if you're a woman, you can talk to someone else you know. If you're a, a man, you can ask someone in your club um, or you can ask a neighbor, spouse, whoever you like, any woman about their science experiences. And here's some questions you can ask, but you don't have to stick to these. Um, just talk to them um, openly about their, are they interested in science or do they, are they one of those folks that maybe are a little bit um, hesitant or scared about science? And, and were there early experiences that maybe led them to feel that they weren't so included? Um, and um, if they have a welcoming experience, tell, have them tell you about that as well. Um, Cause we can always share more, um, more exciting experiences that have some um, positive messages, messages as well. Um, I'm going to write this up and put it in the forum, but I wanted to, um, Oh, Vivian said, should we put it in the forum? Yes, we should. <laughs> so I'll post that in, in the forum tomorrow for you guys to think about, but I wanted to give you a, a sort of heads up so that you can think about, oh, this person, my coworker, or this person, my neighbor, and start thinking about who that person is. And when we post this uh, recording and um, the slides up on the forum tomorrow, we'll include this um, sort of assignment um, about, uh, talking to women about their science experiences. Um, another thing that I want to say is thank you for coming and sharing your stories and participating tonight. Um, if you have any questions or comments about what we did or feedback, um, you can email me at tsummer at astrosociety.org. I'm also going to um, share with you, I have a very quick survey feedback. Um, it's only two questions. And so I'm going to um, put that in the chat. And so that we can, um, that if you could just, you could do it now, or, or I will also add it to the forum later. Um, hold on and let me add this. Yes, Alice is talking about growth mindset. And yes, that is one of the tools we will be sharing. Ah, yes, and um, Vivian is not going to be at Golden Gate Bridging, Ken, but I will be. So uh, I look forward to seeing you. Um, Golden Gate Bridging, it, uh, do you want to talk about that, Ken, and what that is? My first experience uh, was last year, and basically that is when the uh, girls bridge from, uh, I think, is this from the junior level? Yes. Teresa, I, I, uh, they go up to the next level. Uh, it's a big event. Uh, I know last year they had 7,000 some odd participants. I think they're expecting less than that this year. Uh, the girls will get to walk across the Golden Gate Bridge. And we have set up uh, at the end uh, in the park area at Chrissy Field, uh, a bunch of STEM uh, tables. Uh, ASP will be there. We'll be there with the uh, Girl Scout Astronomy Club, SETI will be there. Uh, I think there's like 50 participants or so. Uh, and most of these are all uh, STEM, STEM related. So I was really happy to be involved last year for the first time and I'll be doing it again this year. Yeah, I think it will be a, a really great event. It's, this is my fifth time doing it. And it's, it's just fun when you have these outreach opportunities with Girl Scouts to, um, to see how excited they get and to show them their um, first couple of uh, views of either the sun or um, tomorrow we're studying, we're going to do information about the electromagnetic spectrum, sorry, Saturday. Um, and so uh, it's real, really a fun time for them. And um, it's Alice said that her girls came down from Seattle. <laughs> so took the bus down. Um, so I just put in the um, chat the um, form. As I said, it's only two questions. And so, um, yes, if you, um, uh, Vivian said she would share her story if you want. If, um, yes, I would love that. I, I really love Jennifer's story, but I think um, a lot of women in science have a story about when they're getting into science and they're so, we're so excited about becoming scientists. And I, um, I was in community college. I was putting myself through college uh, and I wanted to study physics. I just thought physics was the cool, I still think physics is pretty much the coolest thing ever. And, um, and I went 
to look at colleges uh, to transfer to four-year universities. And I went to UC Berkeley, went to UC Davis. They were uh, colleges in uh, nearby. And I was at UC Berkeley with a group from my community college. And we were all sitting there and there were a lot of women in the audience. And the, um, the head of the physics department there at the time, now this was 20 years ago at least, said, um, so, if you're interested in, um, I'm trying to remember, if you're interested in uh, looking at black holes, you can go work with this person. If you're interested in lasers, you can go work with this person. But if you're interested in finding women, you're going to have to go to the nursing department because we don't have any here. And I thought, oh, <laughs> wow, that is not very welcoming at all to me as a woman looking to study physics. Um, and luckily my mom taught me to always write letters. So I wrote a letter to him and to his boss, <laughs> sent it off, <laughs> um, upset. But I, I think that a lot of women have these kind of experiences, big and small, as we, even if we're really excited about science and it didn't stop me. It's not that I stopped. I, I got a degree in physics, but I, um, it definitely did not make me feel very welcome in, at UC Berkeley. So I didn't end up going there. <laughs> Yeah, and unfortunately, we do have we all have our stories like that. But uh, what I think is great is that you know we're we're trying to have different experiences and create really welcoming environments, and so that can be an amazing um, gift that you guys can all do as you're going through the world and and um, doing these outreach events that you you always do and do such wonderful jobs at. It just you know, we're just getting more tools to be more welcoming. And um, yeah, <laughs> so well, uh, hopefully Berkeley's a little bit different now, <laughs> but yeah. Um, and if anyone wants to share those stories in the forum, you, we could do that as well. Um, but, uh, you know, a little bit of, of these stories is okay. And then we also want to get into talking about how, um, how, how wonderful things are that it's changing. <laughs> so um, it, does anybody have any questions or things they want to add before we, um, we sort of say goodnight, uh, especially to our East Coast friends? Thank you again. <laughs> Anyone have things they want to add? This, um survey that you wanted to do for women, where to put that on the chat before next meeting? Yeah, I, um, I just put it in the chat right now, and it's only two questions, so if you want to do it right now, you can just click on the link in the chat, um, and or copy and paste that link if you would like. Um, it just to give, because this is our first time doing that, this workshop online, It's it we've changed things a lot to make it more um more online friendly <laughs> so um we'd love to just get some feedback if you have it yeah but but that's that's one thing but you had you brought up one of your ladies slides that said ask a question uh, a woman about their science experience or exposure etc that's not in the questions that you posted um with the link it but is that right up are we to do that before next session next week what it, what is the timing of that response do we even need to post anything just to have it ready to talk to thank you so much for bringing that up yes i so i was sharing some questions that you can ask um when you talk to your uh, woman friend about their science experiences and um, i'm going to post both this recording and the slides tomorrow and also as a separate post I will start the discussion about what, how things went with your, um, the woman you spoke to about her science experiences. And, uh, and I will write the questions out um, I, so that we can all um, share them, that slide. Does that make sense, Penny? Okay, so you want us to put it up on the chat? In the forum. In the yeah. forum, yeah. Yeah, exactly, okay. thank you. Um, yes, the, the two questions are just uh, what what was the biggest takeaway for tonight for you and um, if there's anything you would like to change. Um, so that's it's great feedback for us. 
Um, so that's the link that's in this little chat here. And, um, oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, so um, feel free to do that now, or if you're too tired, you could do it tomorrow. I will include that link, that feedback form um, in the forum as well. So lots of things for me to post in the forum tomorrow. <laughs> Have a great evening. And, um, and, and thanks for joining us again. Thank you. Thank you. And so I stopped sharing my slides. I'm going to end the meeting here. Thank you so much.